song goes. Crazy. So the big wheels that I'm looking at, the reel, is that what's yeah, called, called the reel? The reel, so it rake, it, it's raking the crop, kind of raking it in, but it's also helping the, the, the soybean plant stay standing upright okay. so that the, the cutter bar can cut it, that makes sense. Gotcha, and the cutter bar is the, the little like scissor-like things on the bottom, yeah, right? Yeah, the knives. So that's yeah. basically what you're running along the ground right now. Exactly. So the, you cut the plant right off, right at the base. As tight as you can. And then it's running along like a conveyor belt right to the central yep. section. Yep, that's called the feeder house. It's taken it into the feeder house of the combine, which takes it into the belly of the combine, and, and uh, then from there it separates. And it's it's ba basically like a factory on wheels. So the big wheels that I'm looking at, the reel, is that what's yeah, called, called the reel? The reel, so it rake, it, it's raking the crop, kind of raking it in, but it's also helping the, the, the soybean plant stay standing upright. Okay. So that the, the cutter bar can cut it. That makes sense. Gotcha. And the cutter bar is the, the little like scissor like things on the bottom, yeah, right? Yeah, the knives. So that's yeah. basically what you're running along the ground right now. Exactly. Just, so you uh, cut the plant right off, right at the base. As tight as you can, yeah. And then it's running along like a conveyor belt right to the central yep. section. Yep. That's called the feeder house. It's taken it into the feeder house of the combine, which takes it into the belly of the combine. And, and, uh, and from there it separates. And it's okay. basically like a factory on wheels. So then it, it pulls the, the bean pods off and then kind of like cracks the bean pods open. How does it exactly do that? Well, it doesn't really pull the bean pods off. It's basically taking and uh, it's threshing uh, the bean pods. It's threshing the beans out of the bean pod while the bean pod is probably, some of them are on the plant, on the stem, some of them aren't. They're all, they're all mangled together. It's not like it's stripping the pods off of the stems. Gotcha. It's actually all going on as one piece and, and, uh, and separating. Uh, you can see the grain coming in the grain tank behind us here. The windows are coming up. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, all, that's all your beans right there, huh? Yeah, we can hold about you know, 300 bushels on this combine. And then our grain buggy, we can haul about 800. 850. And, uh, so our semi, we can haul a thousand. So in, in essence, we can hold a little, little over, the, over three combine loads on this one semi load. So this, this, this is called a head. This whole yeah, right? this is the header. Obviously, there's a this head will cut wheat as well, harvest wheat in the middle of July. Um, it'll harvest all other small grains. Uh, that, a lot of small grains that we don't raise in this area and then you know for, for row crops like corn uh, we, we plant corn on 30 inch rows some farmers are planting on 20 inch rows closer together uh, we have a separate corn head that we use for the, for the corn the big issues a lot of times when you're running soybeans or running a platform header like this tight to the ground is it's trying not to pick up rocks or trying to watch for rocks. And most of the rocks over years of using the same field have been removed, right? Well, if you're in a no-till system, you know, you can have most of those rocks picked up and, and uh, you, in a lot of cases, won't bring up any more rocks if you do continuous no-till. Uh, unless you're unless you're side dressing corn or something, putting your your uh, nitrogen on, maybe your your knife might pull up a rock or two. But uh, a lot of guys still do some tillage, whether it's uh, conventional tillage or, or they do uh, minimum tillage. Then you you know you go and you work that ground, and you're going to pull up some rocks regardless. So There's something that usually most every farmer is content with. So uh, why soybeans? Um, we like to try to stay on a rotation. Um, 
So soybeans this year, corn next year? Well, we usually we like to be half and half, or, or better yet, a lot of guys still are raising winter wheat uh, in the area in Pigway County. Um, so I guess the ideal situation would be to raise all three commodity crops. Uh, it's probably the best practice for the land um, to have a rotation. A, a three-year rotation is probably the best. I mean, four would be the ultimate. Um, but right now, with commodity prices, at the same time, the farmer has to be profitable. And winter wheat, in, in a lot of farmers' minds, it's just not where it needs to be to be profitable. Probably seen where a farmer will go in after the winter wheat and plant double crop soybeans, so they're getting two crops out of one year, one growing season. Um, that, that's a common practice in our area, and uh, it's uh, it, it does make wheat a little more attractive if you do that, if you get the right rains. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you don't get those those late summer rains that, or those even late fall rains that you might need for a double crop soybean plant uh, but right now I've seen a lot of a lot of good looking double crops in the area uh, but it's just been a I think a real good year all around pretty challenging with stuff. so as we're running through the field we're constantly bringing in crops so um, we have a yield monitor um, that reads yield as we go through the field and then when you lift up at the end it tells you your average what you're averaging so, and also uh, the monitor typically uh, reads moisture as well. Right now our moisture sensor is not working, um, but it's, it's really amazing. I mean, uh, technology today, uh, you can uh, map a field and uh, see where your more productive areas are, which are usually your better soil types and your less productive areas, or your clay soils or your hill, hilly knolls that uh, just don't produce very well. But shows by color, you know, darker green being the better the better crop and the lighter green being the lesser crop. And you can go and then make decisions on how you want to apply fertilizer. Um, because now we have technology with variable rate technology that allows you to go and put X amount of fertilizer in, in those better areas and a different amount of fertilizer in the lesser areas. And uh, so then that allows you to not necessarily use less fertilizer, but to put the fertilizer where it's needed gotcha. in a better way, use it, using it more efficiently. And then to go beyond that, you know, a lot of, a lot of larger farmers are, are taking those maps and they're layering those maps year after year after year. So they have multiple years of data and then they can go and take that prescription and actually use it in their planter now. And so on those higher yielding environment soils, uh, they'll go and, and, uh, and raise uh, maybe a hybrid that's, that does well in those type of environments. And then the soils that struggle and are, it's harder to raise a higher yielding crop on, they'll go and plant, um, possibly like with corn, they would plant maybe a lesser population. And it's, a, it's an irony, it's actually, it's actually opposite for soybeans. So, uh, soybean situation you would go and try to put uh, more soybean plants on the tougher soil and you put it on the better soil it's there's a it's a real science in, in a lot of ways oh, in, sure in this day and age uh, if if our grandfathers or, or their fathers can see what, what's being done today I I don't know I kind of question whether they would even want to farm you know it may give them a headache thinking about it but uh, there's there's a uh, it's just so different. It's so it's so night and day. Uh, it really is. I mean, to be able to to uh, to let go of the steering wheel and, and uh, let the tractor drive itself, and you can eat your lunch, you can make a phone call, you can to market grain, you know, to uh, to see where the semi trucks at. Um, you can watch for rocks better. I mean, just the, the technology has been so. Fleet management in cap. It has, it has. I mean, the day and age, well, the day and age has come, I guess, that, you know, well, now we have uh, tractors that are uh, autonomous that uh, can drive themselves. They aren't being really used yet, 
by anybody in production agriculture. I mean, they're still they're still kind of a concept vehicle. Um, so that's that that's probably the potential, you know, in the future is to uh, maybe have you know two or three smaller tractors that you're sitting in your pickup truck and you know you're watching them run, kind of monitoring them. Uh, so where you don't have to have an operator, you don't have to be in the cab. You can, multitasking doing other things <laughs> it's just the, 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 there are, there is there is a big disconnect in uh, what's happening out here I mean people are driving by this every day and they walk through the grocery store and they don't really understand you know they, or they don't even think about it I know there's children that think oh that the food comes from the grocery store and that's just not it's not the reality so just trying to educate uh, young people and uh, it is really, really important. What would be a good place for people to educate themselves? Uh, you know, stop by a field and, and, and visit a farmer. Get to know your local farmer. Get to know, um, you know, a local CSA. It's a community supported agriculture. Uh, we have, there's New Century CSA in, in Pickway County. There's uh, Rhodes Farm Market. I mean, there's, there's multiple ways to get connected with vegetable produce growers, commodity crop, you know, producers, livestock producers, uh, whether that's you know, raising hogs or, or having a, a dairy operation. Um, it, it's all around you, and, and uh, you know, really, it's just a matter of going and stopping by and being neighborly to your your neighboring farmer and saying, "Hey, I want to understand, you know, how is my food produced." asking questions. So we just got started yesterday. A lot of guys have been running for maybe a week or two, especially closer to Circleville. Um, so the harvest is just starting. Uh, some guys will finish before pumpkin show and some guys may not get finished until after Thanksgiving. That's based upon what? That's based upon their own plants and their own field? Yeah, it can be based upon that when they plant it. Uh, it's probably mostly based upon uh, the size of the operation. Um, <coughs> a lot of, there's a lot of large farms around. Um, you know, you may farm two or three hundred acres on the side and, and have a full-time job uh, that you work, or you may farm you know, a thousand or two thousand acres and, and be able to get finished, you know, close to that pumpkin show time, depending on when you got started. But, but then you may be a, a large, large corporate farm that uh, has five to ten thousand or ten thousand more, ten thousand plus acres. It, it just depends. If, and if you have that type of situation, you don't necessarily finish later because you, you may have more machinery and more manpower to, to do that job. So just because you're a lot larger doesn't mean you'll you'll finish last or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive how today we can keep up uh, with the machinery we have and we can get so much done with the machinery we have. So this is like our third pass and that, uh, that hopper is getting pretty full. Yeah. How many how many rows? I mean, I know that's based upon how good your, your crop is, but uh, how many rows before you filled up with this thing? Yeah, so uh, it depends on the length of the pass that we're making. Like, uh, you know, you may go down and back and be full on a, on a larger field, whereas on a shorter field, you may go down and back two or three different times. You may make two or three rounds before you're, before you're full. And, and obviously, if we had a hard year with the drought and the lack of rain, we, you know, the, these soybean plants could be half the height, and, um, you know, it would take a lot longer to fill up. So obviously, if we were in corn right now, we're, you know, corn we're bringing in a lot more bushels per acre, so we fill up a lot faster. We we dump on the go on the grain buggy, and uh, we try to get the, the crop out of the out of the field a little quicker because there's so much product when you're when you're in corn. So, soybeans. I guess everybody probably wants to know price. Yeah, it's uh, it's not, it's never. <laughs> I don't think you can ever please a farmer, really, when it comes to that. I, uh, we we want to hit the home run. We want the high yield. We want the high price, and, and uh, we, we want it all. But that's that's probably natural uh, to everybody. I, um, right now, I think I think we've got a decent crop out there. I mean, definitely above average. 
Uh, we had, like I say, we had struggles putting it in the ground. There was quite a bit of replant that took place, uh, not just in our area, but statewide and, and, and nationwide. Uh, that it was really, in a way, it was the year of the replant in a lot of ways. And, uh, so, and that's something you, you, you really don't like to have to do to pull the trigger to decide to replant. Uh, but that's just, uh, that, that was the nature of the beast this year. Um, and uh, so, yeah, commodity prices right now are down. We've come off of uh, oh, probably four or five year stretch, you know, a, a year or two ago, where we had uh, really, really good commodity prices, six, seven dollar corn and, you know, 14, 15 dollar beans. Uh, so now we're in the 10, 10, 950, 10 dollar range on soybeans. And, 350 range on corn, um, so it's uh, it's a little tighter. Um, you know, the yields will help make up for the lack of uh, price a lot of times. Come up here and dump. Yeah, you got a dump, do you? Yeah. 